What's reason? And when you divide a land like Ireland the way it was done, and you can argue the merits of it either way, but the fact is, if you give a minority who feel themselves to be a minority in the island of Ireland all power within an area, they will tend out of fear to act in a way that they hope will protect their interests. So the fear of, it always seems to me that <coughs> the unions in Northern Ireland have never lost the fears of a minority. The sense is still there being a minority in the island of Ireland and being besieged. And that means that fear can drive out reason and lead to people to make mistakes. The minority, of course, that fears because they were the minority within the system as they saw it suffering from it. So that's a one factor which is very powerful in politics, fear. And uh, I think if, if people had been more rational, less absorbed by fears, they would have acted differently on both sides. But the primary responsibility lies to the two governments which let the situation fester, fail to recognize what was building up, and then have to cope with it thereafter. I think when historians come to write about the subsequent period, um, they will note that the British government was better prepared. Early in 69, they had worked out plans for direct rule in Vestry. They realized that at last the tensions were building up. The Irish government had no plans of any kind and had no idea the problems were building up here. In the south, when the violence started here, uh, the government was quite shattered, divided, fell apart. They had a, a real crisis, members of the government plotting behind the backs of the Prime Minister to import arms and to establish a separate branch of the IRA, not the, uh, within one IRA, to have a nationalist branch, because they were so fearful of the official IRA who were as always communists. And fear of communism, which really was never going to be an Irish problem, there were few communists in any part of the island. Fear of that led ministers to plot to split off part of the IRA. And the British IRA came out of that. So you can take it that the handling of the crisis in the South in those first few years was very incoherent, very badly handled. But quickly, we had to learn. And what Irish governments learned and decided was that the, whatever people may have thought in the past, whatever propaganda there'd be about um, Irish unity and using it as a weapon to election times, which parties did quite unscrupulously, whatever about that, um, the uh, our interests as a, as a state, established for then 60 years, 50 years, uh, lay in uh, a peaceful and uh, stable Northern Ireland, which we were within the United Kingdom, or less than until a majority here decided otherwise. And I think actually that although the neglect of Irish governments up to about 1972, uh, certainly until the 60s, is you have to criticize, I think the Irish governments after that became a constructive force in trying to find a solution that would end violence. And I think historians will probably be as kind to Irish governments post-72 as they will rightly be unkind to them before that. Um, the problem that developed then, seen from the point of view that I saw it from, as Minister of Foreign Affairs, Nation Seashell, is that it's not easy for a large country like Britain to apply its mind to the complex problems of an area like Northern Ireland consistently, coherently, uh, over a period of time. At certain times, British governments have applied their minds to the problem and put great efforts in it. And they have great resources and talent for the much bigger country than we are. But much of the time, there has to be a coherent government. Many Irish politicians tend to think of the British as very clever. They're so much clever than we are, they're always trying to do us down or something. The truth is that where we suspect malevolence or plotting conspiracy <laughs> is a stupidity and incoherence in the system. It's a great mistake. Paranoia is very common in politicians. And it's not just... And the more I saw the British government at work, the more incoherent it seemed. Very little <coughs> overall control. And the, the neurotic point of control was that once the RIUC collapsed under pressure of events, and the army were brought in, which I thought a good idea, Naively thought that would, you know, solve the problem. If it sorted out, that was quite wrong. Once that happened, you had a situation which was inherently unsatisfactory, because it is impossible for any army to act as a peace force. Armies aren't meant for peace forces. 
a regimental army with each regiment having different disciplinary arrangements, which is, is unique in that respect, it's even more difficult. <coughs> and a conscript army where they're all age 17 or 18, they don't necessarily make a good policemen. Some will, some won't. But it's a very uneven system of policing. And the other thing is that in Britain, it seems to me, the army rates a bit like the church in Catholic Church in Ireland, give the same veneration. Any criticism of the army is unacceptable. And I believe, and that's confirmed to me by senior civil servants in Britain, that at no stage up to 1997 was a British government totally comfortable in attempting to control the method in which the army provides security in our land. I've been told by senior civil servants that this government came in 1997, first time uh, there was a clear line of command from civilian government to army. And in my own experience as Minister of Foreign Affairs dealing with all the problems here and in the transition, I could see that uh, there was always a reluctance to ensure disciplinary action in that area. Um, and indeed, when the work of strike occurred, um, it's quite clear now in historical retrospect that the British government of the day, the British Secretary of State here, was not sufficiently sure of himself to insist that the army take early action, which I think might resolve the situation. You can argue whether that's true or not, but um, had it had the act at the beginning, we might have a very different situation. Events could be different. So another factor has been that the British government is not a coherent body, as you might think. There's a Ministry of Defence concerned around the army, and the party is reluctant to challenge them. Tories are reluctant because they have a very high view of the army anyway. They were reluctant because they feared the army might not protect them as much. So Northern Ireland was left in a situation where there was a degree of incoherence on the British side. Uh, and I think that contributed to much that happened uh, afterwards. Irish government policy was directed from then on to try to persuade the British government to modify its policies of the security side so that they would tackle instead what seemed to us to be an alienation of the minority which was gradually increasing in intensity and increasing the instability in the North. Um, and that was what my Irish governments have tried to do. People in the North haven't always understood what we're trying to do, but that's what we're trying to do at the time. The Anglo-Irish Agreement was designed to lead to reforms that would lead to support swinging back from Sinn Féin, the SDLP, with the view to persuading Sinn Féin that a policy of armalizing the ballot box together wasn't going to work, and they need to drop the armalite in order to get some of the ballot box. And it's clear now that that agreement did have that effect at the time, should be the but in fact, um, in retrospect, and talking privately to people, they'll tell you that yes, if Gareth could that, get that much of Margaret Thatcher, maybe we could be doing better than the later British government. So there was a, a shift in stance from 86 onwards. So it took an awful long time, the whole process, and it's still not complete. But behind it lies politicians um, who sometimes neglectful of their duties, sometimes taking them seriously, sometimes making mistakes and misjudgments. And I think for a large country like Britain, it's not easy for politicians there to empathize with and understand the fears of unionists or the fears of, of nationalists. Um, big countries don't easily understand small countries. Small countries to survive have to try to understand big countries. So. <laughs> In a sense, it's easier for the Irish government to adopt a rational policy than for British government, which can't easily understand all these complications. Uh, there are just a few observations now. You may disagree with them. You may want to challenge all kinds of points I've made, but I just some thoughts that come looking back at the whole thing. Because in looking at history, the important thing is to understand it's not a piece of justifying. There's no justification justification for the things that have been done and have been undone and left undone. But you need to understand why it happened. It's not that people are being clever or benevolent. They find themselves in a situation under pressures uh, to act in a particular way. And they don't always stand up for these pressures. They don't always act intelligently. They don't always act with a full understanding of the factors involved. And things can be a mess. But it is important to understand that really is why things go wrong. It's not that people are, are malevolent. They're in the situation they find themselves in. And they're acting as best they can, often making a mess of it. But 
and you have to ask yourself, if you were there in that job, and you had the choices to make, would you have done that much better? Uh, would you have shown more courage? Perhaps lost your seat in politics, or your party lost <coughs> an election by doing the right thing instead of the popular thing. It's easy to say you would, but would you in fact get to the point? Um, I don't think there's any evidence that as generations move on, the politicians either behave better or worse, <laughs> tend to make the same kind of mistakes. But it is important trying to understand why people act. And that's what history should be about. And we tend to judge the past by the standards of the present. And it's no good doing that. I mean, it was the case that everybody accepted executions from up to the 50s. Now, in Britain, people were executed. Nobody today, anywhere in Europe, would accept executions. No country could join the European Union if it had a process of executing people. So you have to understand that people in the past were different. It was a different situation. They thought differently. There's no good saying they were wrong to execute people. No doubt by our standards they were. But you have to understand that in a world where executions were normal, um, it's not surprising that they happened. And we just happen to have a more enlightened view on that. But you have to put yourself back in the minds of the people concerned as to why they acted the way they did. And just giving executions as an example, there are many other examples. Our standards change over time, our views change. Sometimes for the worse, sometimes the standards we apply deteriorate in some areas. In others, they, get, they improve. But there's no good condemning people in the past because they didn't act the way we would today. We were so enlightened, it isn't like that. Uh, they had to act by the standards of their time in search of the found themselves in, do the best they could, and then looking back on it, realize what mistakes they'd made. So there are just a few general observations, but I'm quite happy to take any questions or points you want to put to me, and it's not to be bad. Do you anything else? Well, I'm just sitting down. Okay, sure. Thank you. with a solid basis behind it, that's what it's about. And um, uh, in order to satisfy that aspects of nationalism in the South and North, we put the alternatives, a unitary state, a federal confederal state, a joint authority, or any other solution. Now we weren't expecting that she'd say yes to the first three, though I thought I'd get some little distance with the start, which some of our ministers would have accepted. But the fourth option was there. And what happened was that we started the negotiation. It went quite well. And then there was a change of, of uh, Northern Ireland Secretary. Northern Ireland Office were kept out of the negotiation at the beginning. They were furious. The negotiation was the Cabinet Secretary and the Foreign Office, in a sense, negotiating with us. But the Northern Ireland Office was kept out. And in fact, the Northern Ireland Secretary came down to Dublin about something else and told us, those crowd are mad, keeping us out of a negotiation about Northern Ireland. They said that to us directly. Um, but uh, they were brought in after a while in this negotiation. Uh, and uh, 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 negotiation went a certain distance. But then we had a difficult point. And as we left, we left Checkers, Margaret Thatcher said, you look down, Garrett, are you? I said, yes, I am. I didn't think it went well. So we gave our press conferences. She at five and me at six. Um, and she, I got the transcript of the press conference later on. She actually went out of her way to be helpful and went further than the expected to do what she said until she was asked a simple question to which she gave a truthful answer. What about the three alternatives? <coughs> that's out, that's out, that's out. It was perfectly correct. We'd stopped talking about them four months earlier. But the press didn't immediately know this and her tone of voice sounded so negative that all the good work she'd done the previous two hours an hour uh, was lost. Well, I got a report back from somebody who dashed back from her press conference.